Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Increasing Access to Behavioral Health Resources for Military and Veteran Children and Families, sponsored by SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans, and their Families Technical Assistance Center. My name is Alexandra Mead and I will serve as your moderator for this afternoon. I'm a Project Manager of Practice Improvement with the National Council for Behavioral Health. Before I begin, I'd like to draw your attention to some important webinar logistics. During today's presentation, your slides will be automatically synchronized with the audio, so you will not need to flip any slides to follow along. There are two audio options for today's webinar, phone or computer audio. If you're using your telephone, please make sure to enter your audio pin number into your phone. You may send us questions at any time during the webinar by submitting them through the Q&A option located in the navigation bar. Depending on the question, we may type, a, type an answer back to you or save it for the end, and we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. This webinar is being recorded and an audio version of the entire webinar, as well as a PDF of the presentation slides, will be available on the webinar archives page of the National Council website within 48 hours of this broadcast. Following the webinar, we invite you to please complete a short survey. And now, if you're ready, Cicely, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. It's really exciting to be joining all of you across the nation for this important topic. I'm honored to be serving as SAMHSA's Military and Veteran Affairs Liaison, where I have the opportunity to work alongside the great people at our service members, veterans, and their Families Technical Assistance Center, and to work with amazing colleagues who you'll hear from today on this important topic. One thing that is important to share with everyone today as we go into this material is that this is a topic that is a great area of importance for all of us in the work that we do to ensure that our military and veteran families have access to quality behavioral health resources. Today's topic is going to focus on a number of great resources that our colleagues over at the Department of Defense have to offer, as well as our friends at the American Red Cross. Additionally, later on in the program, you'll hear from uh, Philip Patty about some of the great resources that happen to be available, again, from uh, another group of colleagues within Health and Human Services as well. So on behalf of our administration here at SAMHSA, I just wanted to again say thank you to all of you for deciding to spend the next hour with us. We hope this will be a really informative program for you and look forward to sharing this great information. Next slide. Uh, disclaimer is important to share that the views and opinions and content expressed in the presentation in its entirety do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA or HHS at this time. Next slide. So it's important to know if this is your first time joining us through one of our SAMHSA SMVF TA Center webinars that since about 2008, SAMHSA has been really working hard to support our states and territories and communities all across the country in helping to strengthen their behavioral health systems that serve our service members, veterans, and their families. Our TA Center is here to provide a number of resources and we're so glad to be able to provide some of these virtually, uh, including the webinar today. SAMHSA helps to lead the efforts to ensure that both substance use and mental health issues among all Americans, inclusive of our service member and veteran families are very well understood and support can be garnered from a number of resources, both on the federal and state levels. Next slide. So our efforts really focus around strengthening these ongoing collaborations among key military and civilian stakeholders, like those that are listening in today. We really want to help states and territories and communities learn how you can connect and share from these programs and increase awareness of the program so that our military and veteran families have access to these great programs within their own communities. It's important to know that this work is something that we coordinate among many federal departments, and we're here to serve as a resource to you uh, in the jobs that you are playing locally, whether you serve as a family member, a supporter, or a professional in the field trying to support our military and veteran families. Next slide. 
So again, I mentioned briefly that we have a number of different ways to provide these resources to you. You can see those on the screen that include things from in-person academies, um, if efforts to do a number of different areas where we're engaging communities to look at how to map best practice uh, models within those local communities, important efforts to hear from communities about the needs for technical assistance on various topics and build learning communities and communities of practice around those topics for our states and cities. And we have experts and panels of subject matter experts that are available that we can bring uh, to your communities virtually as needed. Next slide. So today's objectives are really clear to facilitate a number of um, great informational uh, areas that will provide both resources, tools, and information for listeners today on how you can both engage with and share about these best practices that are available for our military and veteran families. We want folks to be able to get an understanding of recent expansions to programs and key benefits such as the uh, programs that are coming to our service member families through TRICARE and other military-related services there at DOD, and to provide an overview of ongoing collaborative efforts and partnerships that help work to ensure that there's a long continuum of behavioral health services and resources for those that need them, both upstream and uh, in uh, more acute settings as well. It's critical to understand that today's webinar is going to focus mostly on the resources that our friends at Department of Defense have to share. And in later sessions, we'll look at other resources for families that have transitioned out of DOD into community settings as they become veteran families. Next slide. Continuing on, we're gonna be looking at how we work together um, to really support our caregivers in this space. It's really going to be some great information brought to us by our colleagues at the Red Cross that you'll be hearing from and talking about some of the best practice programming that they're bringing to bear for nations or for caregivers all across our nation. And to explore those opportunities for both public and private collaboration and partnerships as an option for supporting our military caregivers. Next. So today you have a great lineup of folks that you are hopefully going to learn a lot from. And these are individuals that are doing an amazing job for us in settings that are really critical. So I'm going to do a brief introduction um, and bio of each of them that you should have had available to you in the webinar announcement. And then we'll get right into the content for today. Um, please note, again, we'll have some time for question and answers at the end of today's webinar, so please don't hesitate to share those in the question and answer section. So um, we are honored to be joined with our first presenter, who is Dr. Kelly Blasco, and she is filling in for Dr. Patty Mosley, who you might have um, seen on the first announcement. And let me just share a little bit about Kelly's background. She happens to be a counseling psychologist who's helping to lead the Mental Health Clinical Integration Program for the Defense Health Agency. And she has earned her master's degree in both marriage and family therapy at Appalachian State University and PhD in counseling psychology from Pennsylvania State University. Her area of expertise is in developing technology solutions to improve the overall health for our military service members and their families. She's internationally recognized for this work and helped to create the award-winning Military Kids Connect site and resources with partners at Sesame Street for military families. She's currently managing a number of projects that help design and develop web and mobile apps to improve the adoption of mobile technologies in a number of clinical settings across the military health system. We're really honored to have Kelly here with us today. And joining her is her colleague, Dr. Erica Slayton, the Associate Director of Outreach and Engagement for the Military Community Support Programs Office and the Military Community and Family Policy under the Office of Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Ms. Slayton serves as the Associate Director for Military Community Support Programs within that office and leads outreach and engagement teams for three centrally funded Department of Defense programs, the Military One Source, Military and Family Life Counseling, and the Spouse Education and Career Opportunities programs that you'll be hearing about today. She's worked for many years serving the military community. And prior to joining this office, she worked in a family program communication specialist 
as part of the National Guard Bureau's efforts for family readiness. She continues to develop and implement a number of plans that help our service members and veterans access information and resources and enhance their readiness and resilience. Our third speaker today is coming to us from the American Red Cross. Ms. Melissa Como is the director of the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network, service to the armed forces through the American Red Cross. She's the proud spouse and caregiver of United States Marine. Her husband completed four different deployments and after 13 years of service was medically retired from the Marine Corps due to a number of combat related injuries. She herself authored the book, Sleeping with the War, published in 2015 and has brought the family and caregiver perspective to life after combat for so many. Melissa served as a fellow for the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and has a long history of providing peer support to military families and supporting efforts at the Blue Star Family, through Psych Armor and the Military Family Advisory Network. She was recently appointed to the Federal Advisory Committee for Veterans Families, Caregivers and Survivors at the US Department of Veterans Affairs. And she's a well-known recognized advocate for the military and veteran community, continuing to support the work of caregivers in her current role as the director of the American Red Cross Military and Veteran Caregiver Network. It's important to know that these three speakers were combined today to provide you with a really great wealth of information on key topics that we think will be very beneficial to the audience. So thank you again to our speakers for joining us and we'll turn things over if you could do the next slide to Dr. Kelly Blasco, again, the lead for the Mental Health Clinical Integration Program Connected Health Branch at the Defense Health Agency. Kelly, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Cicely, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for attending the webinar so that you can hear about some of the great things that we're doing within the Defense Health Agency and partners across the DOD. Uh, I want to just uh, mention that my colleague, Dr. Patty Mosley, has been spearheaded many of these efforts and we co-lead this program together and our mission really is to increase behavioral health resources for military children and families. Next slide. I'm going to talk about kind of two major things. Uh, next slide. Uh, one is how TRICARE has changed to actually uh, address a need for more um, readily accessible uh, providers, mental health providers. And then the second thing I want to talk about is a program that was in response to um, our the National Defense Authorization Act, looking at how can the DHA and DOD improve the overall behavioral health of military children. So um, to start out with, I'll speak to the TRICARE um, information. Next slide. I'm going to be reviewing this, but I really am not going to get down into the exact details of all the changes and would recommend if you wanted more further information to actually go out to either TRICARE.mil or um, search on the TRICARE manual changes that are available actually on health.mil. But um, as early as 2016, we had um, been uh, in DHA, we knew that we needed to um, really uh, increase our uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder treatments, uh, the CAPE benefit uh, to cover our beneficiaries. So in that time, um, in the Federal Register, we put together the plan that, or proposed the plan that would be moved forward. And it actually has um, gone into um, the actual updates that are, were published in 2017. And it really was focused around four areas. One was um, to address how we, the benefit would work um, based on the principles of mental health parity. Um, the Department of Defense is not necessarily mandated to follow the mental health parity laws, but we realize that it's really important to be able to provide uh, similar types of um, parity when we're talking about mental health and substance abuse disorders. 
So we addressed that in our changes. We also expanded coverage out in our purchase care, which is any of the services that are provided outside military treatment facilities and in the community. So we wanted to make sure that we were um, building on best practices and evidence-based practices that are available to our civilian population that we were following in suit uh, to uh, serve the military and veterans as well. Um, one of the things that we realized is that to actually become a TRICARE provider was a, a fairly um, lengthy uh, process and often was a lot more stringent than just sort of the, um, the uh, uh, general uh, public or general provider's uh, 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 capabilities. So we just, uh, worked on streamlining that process so that we would have more uh, mental health and, and substance abuse providers available to our beneficiaries. And then um, was, uh, different types of care was looked at in, toward, in order to expand the limits um, within um, the guidance of our NDAA as well as the health care needs of our population. And as I mentioned, um, there were TRICARE manual changes and these are all that I spoke about are reflected in this update. Um, that uh, was published on, in June 2017. Next slide. Another important change to, um, that we were, uh, that was implemented had to do with TRICARE qualifying life events. So there's um, two specifically related to TRICARE Prime and TRICARE Select. Um, both of these are programs where TRICARE Prime focuses mostly on having really services through the military treatment facility and it being um, uh, directed by a primary care manager. Um, and Select, um, TRICARE Select, uh, gives a little bit more flexibility in terms of selecting providers outside uh, the military treatment facility. And sometimes prior to this, there was a very uh, fluid uh, back and forth, and we decided to implement this qualifying life events. And those events center around military changes like activating or deactivating if they're injured, um, separating from service, and so on, and family changes, which I think in, um, in the civilian uh, insurance uh, policies that a lot of these follow those same guidelines. So, you know, if you're having a baby, um, kids uh, aging to go into college, and, and so on. So, um, really what this allows for is when these events occur, options to change care, TRICARE change, or change TRICARE care <laughs> to what best fits your needs at that time. Next slide. The other thing about um, this is to really help our beneficiaries uh, plan ahead in their care. So there are programs that once um, there is a separation or um, moving from the military or another qualifying event, that actually there are programs to provide temporary health care coverage. Um, one is the Transitional Assistance Management Program, which is uh, when a service member may be uh, separating for various reasons, um, they would have this kind of premium free period of time where they would get TRICARE benefits. And then also the Continued Health Care Benefit Program, which uh, is a premium based, but um, en enables that kind of bridging as well. Next slide. So now I'm going to shift, I just spoke about the TRICARE changes related to mental health and substance abuse disorders, but I also am going to talk about um, our response to the request from uh, the uh, uh, NDAA to actually be able to better identify military children at risk for mental health conditions related to deployments and to propose a program that would help develop tools, education, and guidance for providers and parents, and ultimately to the children. Uh, when we started looking at this, 
um, we did two things. First, we did an environmental scan of all the research literature related to mental health conditions um, for military children. And uh, there is a uh, quite a bit of evidence showing some of the impact on uh, from deployment onto um, our military parents and, and family. Um, we also looked at TRICARE um, data um, to, to identify what were some of the most common mental health conditions that were being addressed um, in the uh, military health system for children. And we were able to identify four of the top uh, uh, diagnoses. One was um, conduct disorder, uh, anxiety disorder, depression, and uh, adjustment disorder. So much of the tools, education, and guidance were focused around these four uh, mental health conditions. Um, so what we did next was then, okay, let's look across the DHA and the DOD to see if there are any programs that will be able to meet this need and um, provide a, a series of interventions or prevention. So based on that, um, we, we developed the program based on those pieces of information. And I will, uh, next slide, I will talk about um, kind of how we uh, put the framework around for that. So the first thing we did was look at the, the Institute of Medicine, um, the uh, kind of the continuum of care of interventions. So you'll see on this slide really the socio-ecological um, model where you know you have the child in the center, the patient-centered approach, and building out in terms of the family uh, support, you know, what is the military and civilian community doing to support, and then the culture at general within the military culture as well as um, the larger um, societal culture. And within that framework, there's various different intervention settings. Um, and it depends on prevention versus intervention. So certainly there's universal prevention, which would be more like health promotion, reaching out, universal messaging, and then moving into the other types of um, prevention. Also, within intervention, there's different things like partial hospitalization, opioid treatment, like intensive outpatient treatment, and so on. And then moving into just a regular care around primary care, behavioral, outpatient behavioral health, and even interventions in schools and um, at home type of interventions. So we looked at that whole framework, and if we go to the next slide, we tried to see uh, what programs in the DOD kind of fall within this spectrum in this model. And we actually found that there are quite a few programs across um, DOD and within DHA that uh, actually address um, within this framework. So um, we really created a uh, connector program. So you'll see all these different programs uh, really um, were brought together. Um, and the core of the program around Connector was to be able to provide universal messaging to our beneficiaries about um, prevention and health uh, care needs for military children to link to Military One Source Confidential Call Center for um, consultation um, and then into care. Next slide. The, uh, this connector program was then, we really needed to partner with all these, uh, within each of these programs. So we brought together partners all across the DOD to, and uh, SAMHSA as well to kind of shape these programs and build on each other. I won't go into all the specifics here because of time, but if we go to the next slide, you will see that we've built these partnerships. Um, and right now, um, we work most closely um, with the uh, military community and family policy and the DOD education activity, as well as SAMHSA. But all of these uh, programs, list, uh, partners listed on here, are we work in and out with um, depending on the need of, the, uh, of our population. 
Next slide. And I wanted to highlight, there's a list of all these milestones, and I'm not going to go through each of one of them, but I want to highlight four key, at, key parts of this. One is that we brought this program to the Military Family Readiness Council, and they made the recommendation to the Secretary of Defense for this program, which was accepted. We also partner with SAMHSA on many programs between 2017 and currently to support um, their, um, their programs towards to help military families um, and the uh, National Mental Health Awareness Day for Children. Um, we also brought partners together to um, brief on special interest topics so that then we could message through various programs uh, such as bullying, suicide prevention, um, and so on. And then finally, uh, most recently, we have a collaboration um, that we work monthly to figure out um, with all partners, like what is the messaging for that month on a particular topic? What are we doing across social media? What new resources, resources are coming out to, um, to uh, promote uh, so that everybody knows about it? And then taking the opportunity to coordinate around major events like the month of the military child. So um, that completes my uh, presentation. And I just want to summarize that really DHG and DOD really want to provide the best care for our military families and children. And so we know we need to do it together as a community and as partners. And each of us have that role. So um, just look for more to come and to monitor both um, what's happening on Military One Source as well as within SAMHSA and the DHA, and you'll be aware of all the great things that are um, coming out and more to come. Thank you. So at this time, I have the pleasure of handing it over to Dr. Erica Splayton, um, a colleague and she will be uh, talking about how um, her program at, in the outreach engagement um, in military community and family policy, how they're supporting military um, families and children. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Blasco. Uh, it is absolutely a pleasure to be here and to be able to share the various resources that we, sh that we provide through the Department of Defense, and specifically through the three programs that we mentioned earlier. Um, my directorate, at, again, is called Military Community Support Programs, and we do oversee Military One Source, the Spouse Education and Career Opportunities Program, and the MFLAC program. So, um, again, this is, is really a, a great uh, pleasure to be here to share with you about all of these resources. Uh, I am also the spouse of a retired Marine, so I have firsthand experience in these programs and that um, I've used them, and to be able to have the opportunity to help shape them is such a, indeed, an honor. If we go to the next slide, I'd just like to share what we're going to cover today. I think we all have the shared mission in supporting our community in any life challenge that can really become more complex during military life. So what we're going to cover today is really the comprehensive support that's available through Military One Source. We'll talk also about the non-medical counseling resources that we offer through two programs. We'll also talk about our Military One Source state consultants and then explore resources and tools available through MilitaryOneSource.mil. So I'd like to move on to the next slide here. And um, the next slide is what we call our range of support slide or, uh, or our Zen slide. <laughs> we call it our Zen slide because we hear from service members and families that it gives them peace of, peace of mind knowing that they can reach out to Military One Source 24-7. So what is Military One Source? Military One Source is a 24-7 call center and website that provides comprehensive information on every aspect of military life. And when I, when I say every aspect, I really do mean every aspect. The call center is staffed by master's level consultants who have an education in a social science field like, like marriage, uh, excuse me, like social science, 
uh, excuse me, psychology or marriage and family therapy. Uh, so they are very astute at listening for those stated and unstated needs. So if you look at the Military One Source logo, think of someone calling into Military One Source or a live chatting into Military One Source. That's the triage consultant that answers that initial call. And they'll be able to direct our military community to any one of the resources that are, that are identified on this particular site, or perhaps it's an installation resource, or it's an, a resource that's available out in the local community. Many people are really surprised to hear that the top reason why people reach out to Military One Source is for the Spouse Education and Career Opportunities Program. That is a virtual program that is an extension of the employment readiness specialist uh, programs that are available on the installation that provides master's level career counselors that are able to support military spouses in their education and career goals. You may not you may know that the military spouse unemployment rate is twenty four percent. So we really have an opportunity to support our military spouses in no matter what phase they are in their military uh, career, their life journey. The second reason why people reach out to Military One Source is for confidential non-medical counseling, and we'll talk about what that means here on a subsequent slide. The third reason for our financial and tax services, uh, we are in the height of tax season right now. Uh, we offer through MilitaryOneSource.mil the filing of a federal and up to three state tax returns for free. In addition to that, we offer tax consultants that are available year-round to support our service members and families with those unique filing requirements that our own military community um, um, has as a part of their tax situation. Within the Military One Source website, every year, service members and families file more than 200,000 federal and state tax returns. I'll just cover a few other, uh, other resources here uh, before we hop into non-medical counseling. And I'd like to talk about elder care. We have uh, our service member, well, service members and families may have additional stressors by in um, really thinking about their aging, aging loved ones. What do I do? I'm stationed in, um, at, at Fort Polk, in Fort Polk, but I have a, a relative or parents that are somewhere else. How do I care for that family member? So you can call Military One Source, and that consultant will be able to provide some additional resources around maybe resources to stay in the home or outside of the home, um, additional uh, resources around uh, medical equipment, um, and really be able to provide that service member, family member, that peace of mind, um, knowing that they can reach out regarding elder care issues. I'd also like to talk about uh, special needs support. Or we have master's level consultants, again, that have education around supporting adults and children with special needs. And that could be educational, educational needs or medical needs. And the great thing about this consultation is it can be done by telephone or by video. And we also have a link to TRICARE, whereby service members and families can get additional resources in terms of navigating perhaps um, different various programs and resources that are available through TRICARE. I'd also like to point out that we offer peer support That's, that is uh, provided by a military spouse or perhaps it is a National Guard or Reserve member or perhaps someone who had former military who can relate to that individual who's calling. And it really can be just around military life. Maybe there's an, un an upcoming deployment and that service member or family member can, can express their concerns. It's more of a conversation around any uh, issue that um, that service member or family member needs. I'd also like to share that we offer document translation and language interpretation services in more than 150 languages. We don't want language to be a barrier to our military families. So 24-7, you can call Military One Source and we will connect you via three-way call with an interpreter. Uh, in addition, we can translate pretty much any official document with the exception of medical records and we will refer that to perhaps a, a different resource at cost but we will refer that out to make additional resources that are available in the local community. And lastly, on this slide, I'd like to talk about our health and wellness coaches. These are 
coaches that are certified. They have a background in in health-related field, and they can support around stress management, nutrition, physical fitness. Maybe it's passing that the PT test that's coming up. They offer their services online, telephonic, by video, and uh, are really a great resource. They are accountability partners. And uh, I've heard this really great story, story from someone who wrote in to Military One Source who said, you know, um, I called Military One Source, got connected with a health and wellness coach, and I went from sitting on the sofa to running within a year, and I lost 20 pounds. Thank you, Military One Source. I did the hard work, but you were there to support me. And that's what we do through Military One Source and the additional resources that I'll share on this next slide. It really talks about non-medical counseling. For non-medical counseling, we often ask, what is non-medical counseling? Well, it is an opportunity for service members and families to receive support around everyday and military life issues that fall below a, a diagnosis. So it's things like stress parent-child communications. In fact, the number one reason why people reach out to Military One Source under the non-medical counseling umbrella is for marriage and relationship issues. Second is just general stress, and third, parent-child communications. You'll see a number of the modalities that we offer here, uh, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online video uh, sessions, or by phone. It is designed to be short-term, so it's up to 12 sessions per person per issue. So perhaps I'm dealing with going through a deployment alone, I can get 12 sessions, and then perhaps once my service member returns, we'll be able to receive another 12 sessions around reintegration or communication issues that we're, ex we're experiencing. We also provide those services to uh, children in a family context if the children um, are, under are under 13. If you're 13 to 17, a parent just has to attend that first session, and then after that, that child can attend those sessions alone. We had a service member that called into Military One Source uh, seeking support because he was stationed in Korea and was seeking support to uh, ensure that he and his wife um, would be able to enhance their relationship. She was pregnant at the, t at the time and already had two children and just was feeling that stress. So he called in to receive non-medical counseling as a couple face-to-face, uh, -face, and then they would potentially, potentially uh, continue those non-medical counseling sessions via video. And what I like about the services that we offer via video is that this reaches out to support those service members and families who are geographically dis ge geographically uh, dispersed and located across, uh, really across the world, and we can do that by video to connect them to those services. If we go to the next slide, I'd like to talk about additional resources for non-medical counseling, and that's through the Military and Family Life Counseling Program, or MFLAC program. There are more than 2,300 counselors uh, there are child and youth behavioral counselors and military and family life counselors that provide support at over 230 installations in 25 countries. We rely on the military services to share with us what their needs are uh, so that we can place those influx on the ground. They provide their services face-to-face, -face, just in time, um, mostly or primarily on military installations through ongoing rotational support. They provide presentations on a number of non-medical counseling talk, uh, topics, and also they, their approach is more of that walk-around approach versus more of a traditional counseling appointment in an, in an office. They do not record their counseling ser their sessions by the names of an in individual, and so it is confidential. And what we hear, again, is that service members and, and families um, are more likely to reach out to a counselor knowing that those notes won't be taken and that they really can get su support around those specific issues. Uh, for children in particular, we have more than half of our child and youth behavioral MFLAX uh, support in DODEA and in public schools. Actually, they support over a thousand DODEA and public schools, but mostly public schools. And so for us to be able to provide that support is, uh, is one of the ways that commanders um, and also our military community can get those just-in-time services. 
Um, we had a, a parent that approached a, a child and youth behavioral impact at, at their school to share that her service or her husband was going to be deploying. And uh, what she shared was that she wanted the MFLAC to meet with both of her daughters because she recognized that her daughter was going to have some challenges. The MFLAC was happy to do so. And what the parent said is that she feels so much better knowing that that MFLAC, that MFLAC, that child and youth behavioral MFLAC was there to support, uh, be there to support her, gir her girls. Um, we also know that non-medical counseling was demonstrated to be effective. We had more than 77% of participants experience a reduction in problem severity, 74% experience a reduction in interference with daily life, and that was not only in the short term but in the long term as well. And more than 95% said that they were likely to recommend non-medical counseling to a friend. I'd like to transition to the next slide. That offers additional support for military families and specifically for new parents. Um, we provide a new mill parent specialty consultation that supports service members and their spouses from the early stages of pregnancy through the development of their child up to age five. And these, co these consultations are unlimited on a variety of topics as you see there. And again, uh, as a new parent, it, it, sometimes it can be very overwhelming. Um, and also dealing with military life, what are some things that I need to start thinking about? And so we offer consult, educational consultations around self-care, understanding developmental milestones. And this is uh, a, an, a consultation that we introduced in October of 2019. It continues to grow support. We go to the next slide. I do want to talk about the state-based outreach, the military one source consultants. These, this is our boots on the ground support. There are 53 state consultants, two in Texas, two in California, and their job really is to spread the word about military one source to ensure that our military community knows that military one source is available. You can request their support. I have a link there. And they are out talking with nonprofit organizations, uh, service members and families, about, again, all of the resources that are available through Military One Source, but also they're identifying different additional resources in the community to then uh, those resources then come back to the call center for vetting. And then when someone calls and looking for a resource in their local community, we're able to provide that resource. We go to the next slide here. Uh, I'd like to do, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the Military One Source website. We continue to evolve the website to meet the needs of our military community. Uh, there are OCONUS calling options. There's live chat capability. The, the site is organized around various topics, and we do have a health and wellness page that covers lots of, of content around uh, support for wounded warriors, caregivers, and then we also link to various mobile applications applications and resilience tools. If we go to the next slide, one of the ways that you can work, that you can receive support as a service provider through Military One Source is to order a variety of products for free on, a, again, a range of topics there. One of our most popular products is the Chill Drill, and uh, it's available for download and what we can order uh, through, um, through the website. You can order through the website and then it will be delivered to your home. It's a set of deep breathing relaxation exercises. Um, and we hear that it's designed to, or not we hear, we know that it's designed to uh, reduce those symptoms of stress, reduce uh, blood pressure and, and, and lower heart rate. If we go to the next slide, I do want to make sure that you know that Military One Source does extend to service members who are separated or retired from um, service up to 365 days or one year post-service. Um, we want to make sure that they have access to all of the resources that we provide through Military One Source, and um, we're con constantly uh, making sure that service members and families know they still have access and we could use your help in uh, helping us spread that word. And if we go to um, the last slide here, it's just a sample of some of the responses that we've received with regard to our programs. Um, and what I like is particularly the ones around the MFLACs and how they can develop, how they can support deployment groups at the schools. 
and how we can even respond to crisis situations or in the aftermath of a crisis situation. And I love the, the last quote there. Every time I call Military One Source, I always learn about more resources available. I always wish I knew sooner. Um, well, um, just in closing, the last slide here again, I just want to uh, thank you for your time today. Well, we want to ensure that our service members and families know that these resources are available to them at no cost, and we would appreciate you to help us carry the water as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Erica. At this point, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Melissa Como with the American Red Cross. Melissa? Thank you so much. I feel so honored to go after Dr. Blasco and Ms. Slayton. You are both tough acts to follow. Um, but my name is Melissa Como and I'm the director of the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network and we can just get started right away on the next slide. So what are the behavioral health challenges that military and veteran caregivers face? And before I get started, I want to clarify who I mean by caregivers. For this presentation, caregivers are those caring for a service member or veteran. They can be a spouse, an adult child, parent, friend, neighbor, battle buddy, to mean veteran to veteran care. Um, and I like to start with the Hidden Heroes America's Military Caregivers uh, RAND report from 2014. This is a vital resource in understanding the challenges caregivers face with their health. And the quote on this slide directly from that study speaks to some of the behavioral health challenges caregivers are facing. Uh, these statistics are presented in both pre and post 9-11 um, form, and that's just the way this RAND report was written, but the, the statistics speak for themselves. 38% of post 9-11 are presented um, with probable major depressive disorder, and 43% are experiencing anxiety. Look at that on the pre 9-11, and it's still, you know, 18.9% and 28.7%. So there is a big opportunity here to um, engage caregivers and help them focus on behavioral health and find resources that can help improve it. Next slide, please. One of the recommendations out of the RAND Hidden Heroes America's Military Caregivers Report is that programs and services should be designed specifically to support these caregivers. In particular, efforts should be made to reduce the, so the uh, social isolation among this population to encourage better health outcomes. So the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network was developed to address this challenge with structured peer support that is available online and in the community. All of our programs and services were incubated at TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, where we were able to learn from their 25 plus years of peer support in the survivor community and were able to change the scope to support caregivers. Using the companioning model and the reciprocal peer support model, our peer programs are designed to deliver best practice quality peer support. Next slide, please. The mission of the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network is to provide our military and veteran caregivers from all eras with peer support programs and services to reduce their isolation, increase their connectedness, engagement, hopefulness, knowledge, and skills. Our goals are aligned with the reduction of caregiver social isolation and increase connection, engagement, knowledge, skills, and hope. We have created a network with partners that works to deliver key support and resources to caregivers all along their caregiver journey. Next slide, please. Our three peer support programs include a custom, secure, caregiver-only online community, a traditional caregiver peer mentor program providing one-on-one -on -one support, and a caregiver peer support groups that occur online and in the community. The entire staff and all volunteers at the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network at Red Cross are veteran caregivers. We live, work, and breathe the caregiver journey. We use these opportunities to model resource location and leveraging and share lived experience to help others not feel alone. The role of peer support in accessing mental health and behavioral health is very positive. While peers are trained to promote good habits, they are also helpful in crisis to ensure caregivers have access to the veteran crisis line or other professional interventions. Anecdotally, our caregivers have reported that they are much more likely to reach out to a resource if they have heard about it from another caregiver. We call this the power of peer referral. And Ms. Slayton, thank you so much for sharing about the importance of peer support at Military OneSource. That really resonated with us. Next slide, please. 
So talking about some of the barriers that are impacting caregivers searching for behavioral health, here are the most common that come up in our peer support programs. The first being, I don't know where to go. And this really speaks to a caregiver that is unaware of resources that are available. We hear that the services are only for the veteran. And this usually comes from a caregiver that has reached out to the VA or another resource that only focuses on the veteran. They haven't been able to find family support or more specifically caregiver support. I don't want to impact my service member's career. So we heard a lot from Military One Source and the importance of having um, non-medical counseling and having it be very private and that they're not writing down names and that there is support that is sensitive to um, the concern for your service member's career. And we definitely don't want that to be a barrier. We want people to know that um, we can help reduce this stigma and, and get people into the services and support that they need. Another uh, quote we hear all the time is that there are no programs for pre 9-11. Um, so there is a disproportionate amount of support between the different eras of service. There are many resources that require the veteran to have served after 9-11 for the caregiver to qualify for services. Now that's not all of them, but a vast majority do have that. Another thing we hear is I don't have time. <laughs> No one has time. Caregivers are very busy with caregiving, work, school, children, and household, et cetera. But we do wanna help them to find options that might meet them at home, uh, telehealth options, uh, ways that we can help caregivers find the time to prioritize their own behavioral health. We don't have the money. Uh, so we hear that there is an expectation that you know, therapy is very expensive and maybe your TRICARE doesn't cover it or maybe your CHAMP VA doesn't cover it. Um, but we want to make sure that caregivers are aware of free resources um, to meet their behavioral health challenges. I don't have any respite. Um, so, of course, it can be very hard to leave a care recipient. And if there is no respite, it might be completely impossible. Um, another thing we hear is kind of the fear of the unknown. Uh, I don't know what to expect. Uh, caregivers are nervous to share their feelings. We have found that this is incredibly um, valuable in the peer role as our peers can help manage those expectations, share their lived experience, and really help people be at ease in seeking and leveraging behavioral health support. And then lastly, uh, there are no child care options. Uh, many caregivers in our network are also parents to young children who need access to child care in order to take care of their own health. Um, so many uh, organizations are now providing child care or taking a more family focus. Um, there are child care opportunities that they can reach out to in order to um, get the behavioral health support that they need. Next slide, please. So it's, I've mentioned a little bit of the resources. Um, there are amazing resources for military and veteran caregivers. Uh, currently, we are referring caregivers to SAMHSA, um, the National Resource Directory, especially with their caregiver focused um, directory. And we have the Hero Care Network at the American Red Cross Service to the Armed Forces, uh, which can help provide a lot of support for caregivers. Um, another benefit of caregiver peer support is having a network of caregivers to recommend resources that have worked for them and shared their experience. The shared experience can be anything from how to find the resource, what forms you can expect to fill out, what documentation is needed to qualify, do they have childcare, can you find respite, um, we have also trained all of our, care, our caregiver peer mentors who can walk caregiver mentees through the process to get the support if they need. It's sort of a virtual handholding, helping a caregiver uh, call a resource, maybe on a three-way call. But we found that peer support can really help elevate people's chances of reaching and being successful in accessing resources. Next slide. So these are our most common uh, resources that are recommended by our peers. So I mentioned SAMHSA. Um, there is a zip code lookup for support in the community on the SAMHSA site where you're looking for help. And we've found that that's very helpful no matter where the caregiver is in the country that they can find a local support. Very, very important. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs Caregiver Support Line. This is a hotline staffed by social workers who can help a caregiver with concerns, recommend resources, or just offer um, a gentle listening ear and, and maybe help them get into better support within the VA system. I mentioned the Hero Care Network at Red Cross. Um, we have just launched a new social care network called Aunt Bertha. 
and Aunt Bertha has a minimum of 700 resources for every zip code in America. Caregivers are able to apply filters and find resources they qualify in their community. Um, it's been very, very popular so far and is ex accessible directly from our website. So caregivers don't have to go and find the directory. They can enter their zip code and maybe a keyword like PTSD or depression and, and get taken right to the resources in their community. Uh, the Cohen Veterans Clinic is doing a wonderful job supporting not only veterans, but the caregivers, families, and children. Their clinics only serve post 9-11 era caregivers, but they are doing a wonderful job. And our feedback has been that their family atmosphere is helping the whole family get support, not just the veteran, not just the children, and not just the caregiver. Uh, Given Hour is a national resource where caregivers can access mental health providers who are willing to donate their time uh, to provide mental health support to veterans and their families. And that's available to caregivers and veterans of all eras. Operation Family Caregiver is a caregiver coaching program delivered through the Rosalind Carter Caregiving Institute. This free program focuses on self-care and problem solving that have been proven to positively impact military and veteran caregivers, and not just the caregivers, but also the veterans that they are serving and their children. Military OneSource, we can't say this enough, what a great job Military OneSource is doing. It is invaluable to our active duty caregivers, but many are unaware that mental health support extends to 12 months post-separation and can be most helpful during transition, which is an incredibly stressful time for some. Um, Ms. Layton also mentioned the elder care and the special needs, which are also hot topics for our caregivers who are looking for support. And then lastly, Psych Armor Institute has an entire library of online caregiver courses that focus on areas such as stress first aid for caregiver, respite, and grief. So very helpful resource there. And then the next slide, this is kind of a force of habit for me on this next slide. Um, I always like to provide the links to any resources that I mention. So this slide is a collection of the resources mentioned on the previous slide and are best to use when learning more or how to connect with these resources. In every single one of our peer support groups that are delivered online or virtually, a follow-up is always provided with resource links, how to get in touch with. So even if a caregiver mentions, oh, I got help through given hour, we are sure that every caregiver that attended that group or attended that event is provided the access to that resource that's mentioned. So that's just a force of habit for me to make sure everyone always has the link to all the resources that I mentioned. And then my next slide is just, I believe my thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share about the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network. Um, this is definitely a heart project of mine, and I feel that SAMHSA and the TA Center have always been incredibly supportive. Uh, my contact information is listed, and please do not um, hesitate to reach out to me for any caregiving-related questions, needs, or referrals. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, this is Philip Patty with SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center. Um, I just wanted to uh, briefly thank and express gratitude to our moderators, Cicely Burroughs McElwain, as well as each of our presenters uh, for their captivating presentations and their informative content with regard to increased access to resources and ongoing programs available to support the needs of our military and veteran children and families. Uh, briefly, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to speak on an, another uh, few key resources and uh, just to remind you this slide deck will be made available um, in a follow-up email along with the other couple uh, key resources for you all to have in your possession. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So uh, briefly I wanted to um, speak on one of our, our resources, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, what CHIP provides a low-cost health coverage uh, to children and families that are not eligible for Medicaid uh, because they're just above the threshold, um, but this provides a lot of key resources uh, that can help those military families. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and I've provided a full slide deck from the Children's Health Insurance Program so that you all can take a deeper dive and look a little bit more into that uh, following this webinar. You can go to the next slide. 
And again, these are just some additional resources. You can see the first one is our uh, SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center uh, listserv. This will uh, let you know when any upcoming uh, learning or technical assistance opportunity is coming your way. Um, it provides uh, the topics in the news for each ongoing month, um, as well as uh, MFRI, Military Family Research Institute. This is a great option for resources and research when it comes to military and veteran children and families. Um, as well as I included the VA special report on women's veterans. Um, also, you'll see there a webinar that we conducted last year on key transitions supporting the behavioral health of women veterans. Wanted to highlight that piece. And as I said, the CHIP program, as well as uh, some resources to Medicaid or CHIP enrollment. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'd like to refer it back to Alexandra from the National Council, and uh, we'll begin fielding our Q&A session. Thank you, Alexandra. Great, thank you, Philip, and thank you again to all, all of our presenters for that really valuable presentation. Uh, we are going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so if, as, as uh, folks are listening in, if you think of new questions, we invite you to continue to submit them in the Q&A box. Um, we will start with a question asking um, if we could please list again the mental disorders that military children may be prone to. I believe this question may be for Dr. Blasco. Yes, um, the answer to that is that based on 2017 outpatient visit data uh, within TRICARE, the top four are adjustment disorder, anxiety, depression, and conduct disorder, not necessarily in order of importance. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, another question asks, can veterans and retirees access Military One Source? Yes, uh, veterans and retirees can access Military One Source. Uh, there is a window, and that's up to one year post separation or retirement. Um, after that, if they're no longer eligible and if they did call, uh, we would refer them to perhaps a resource that's available in the local community or perhaps through the, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Great, thank you. Our next question is from someone who says, I work in a high military population school. How can I refer students and families to get counseling or how can I help connect them? Uh, this is Erica Slayton. Um, as far as the military and family life counseling program, uh, we'd be happy to uh, explore uh, some options, various options. As I mentioned, we currently have uh, more than half of our child and youth behavioral uh, counselors are supporting schools. So what we would do is we would um, identify what, what, where the school is and whether or not there are influx in that local community uh, to see if there's existing support. Um, or, or uh, explore options of adding support. And then there's al always military one source that's available uh, to get families connected to non-medical non counseling resources. My contact information is in the, slide, in the slides and we'll be happy to connect with you to explore that particular question. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, our next question asks, um, we've had a few inquiries around certified peer specialists and how they can be helpful. I'm wondering if we can share a little more around the role of peers. So this is Melissa Como, and I will take that one from the Military and Veteran Caregiver Peer Support Network. For our purposes, um, we are using peers to mean caregivers who have a lived experience. It isn't the professional credential where you might be working in a substance use disorder peer specialist or a mental health peer specialist. However, those specific skills are readily needed in the greater American Red Cross. And if you go to American Red Cross slash volunteer, there are many opportunities to use those peer skills uh, throughout various programs in service to the armed forces. Now, if you are a peer specialist and also a military caregiver, please reach out to me directly because I can put you to use right away. And this is Erica Slayton, and through Military One Source, there are, as I mentioned, a peer support specialist on militaryonesource.mil. Uh, that's one of the 
one of the frequently asked questions is, how can I get connected to military one source, maybe to be a triage consultant or a, a peer support specialist? There they link, whereby you can explore uh, the different opportunities that are available, or just call military one source at 1-800-342-9647 and, and share, that, uh, share that you're looking to get connected um, and to be helpful to Military One Source in that role, and they will be able to provide additional information. Great, thank you. Um, another question, which I believe is for Dr. Blasco, uh, is TRICARE actively reaching out to substance use and other behavioral health providers in states to let them know that they're wanted in the network and that it might be now a little easier for them to become one or anything around that process? Actually, um, we uh, to find out more information from that, if you go to TRICARE.mil um, and select the provider tab, it will um, get give you kind of the criteria and everything. But a lot of things that we depend on are our uh, contracts with our uh, network providers um, in the East and West region, which for East it's HumanaMilitary.com and the West is HealthNet Federal Services. And those uh, are usually where we put out the communications through uh, each of those programs. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're doing our best to answer as many as we can. So just a reminder to folks, you can continue to submit them and we'll try to get to as many as we are able. Um, let's see. I'm wondering if we could share a little more around um, how to best refer, refer folks to services, um, where they should begin in terms of connecting um, and which types of providers they might be able to connect with. Would you like me to answer that one? I'm um, sure, that that'd one. be great. <laughs> So in terms of the medical benefits, certainly uh, depending on if it's a service member, there's readily available behavioral health um, care through the military treatment facilities. And if there isn't, and for Reserve and, and National Guard, if they're not um, near a residential treatment or a military treatment facility, um, they can reach out to their um, network provider and get referrals and in some cases um, do uh, kind of remote uh, 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 connections uh, for that. Um, there are also um, uh, would really encourage uh, if you're receiving um, treatment outside the military treatment facility to go perhaps as a starting point to your primary care um, physician um, to reach out and get referrals uh, in that way. And also there's many um, uh, resources through uh, the, like through the school counseling and, um, and even the military family life consultants that may be able to uh, refer out if further care is needed. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I know that this was covered a bit in the slides, but uh, wondering if we could speak a little more to um, whether services are available to service members and their families who are not on active duty, like guard members or those who live in the community. Um, this may include uh, those who are in the reserve or veterans or folks who are retired. This is <laughs> This is, uh, this is Erica Slayton, and I can just speak to Military One Source first. There may be other uh, presenters that uh, can speak on this particular topic. But uh, with regard to eligibility, um, Military One Source is available for National Guard and Reserve members regardless of activation status. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, once you separate from the military, the Military One Source is available uh, uh, within that one year, within that one year window. Absolutely. And this is Melissa Como from the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network. And we are open to um, caregivers of all status. So guard, reserve, active duty, retired, um, separated, anyone who is providing care to a service member or veteran, regardless of 
when or how, we are absolutely open to supporting them. I've seen some questions come in about families dealing with PTSD. We definitely focus on mental health caregivers as well. So those who might be uh, caring for someone with um, a traumatic brain injury or uh, mental health challenge, those caregivers are welcome just as much as those maybe with wound, illness, injury, or aging uh, situations. We very much focus on that. And from a, that military understanding um, being, you know, I've lived that experience with my, my own husband. We're really bringing that and, and helping reduce stigma and really creating that safe place for caregivers of all eras, all relationships across all locations uh, to be able to share safely and find the resources and support they need. Yeah, and this is Kelly Blasco. I'd like to also add for TRICARE, um, it very much depends on your activation status and whether you're getting TRICARE coverage. Um, so I think what I would do is uh, double check based on uh, National Guard and Reserve status to figure out what the different options are. Great, thank you all, very helpful. Um, this question is uh, in, on a similar page asking if I wanted to find out more regarding what specifically TRICARE covers regarding behavioral health services, where might that information be located? So just a reminder to focus on how to best access that. Yes, um, much of that information is on TRICARE.mil um, and on there you can look um, all, by regions, by uh, the type of, of uh, coverage that you have and should be able to get a list of what's covered and what's not covered as well as some other resources that may link to a particular military treatment facility. Thank you. Um, would any of our panelists like to speak a little more um, around support for folks who are coping with PTSD or who are um, family members who are supporting folks who are, who are coping with PTSD? Yeah, I can uh, speak to that. Um, again, um, it's really encouraged for um, well, the service member who may be suffering from PTSD to reach out um, to many of the embedded behavioral health clinics that are part of, that support their particular units. And for families, um, there are multiple options, but uh, many um, facilities have a child and family behavioral health um, resources or clinics, and those, can often, those provide services to children, uh, families, couples, and um, uh, 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 spouses, sorry. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, there seems to be a, a few questions coming in around those who qualify. Um, what behavioral resources are there for veterans who don't qualify for the VA and who might not have TRICARE if they're a, a military retiree? So this is Melissa Como again with the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network. And one of the resources that I would recommend is actually visiting our herocare.antbertha.com. In that, um, you can search for behavioral health needs um, and resources based on your zip code, your, um, you can put in a, a bunch of personal filters indicating that you are a veteran, and it can pull up community resources that would be um, you know, outside of the VA or TRICARE that might be able to support uh, your behavioral health needs. Great. Um, a new question asks, uh, military family members are often familiar with navigation within civilian care systems. What types of supports might exist for family members going through the transition from military service um, if there's um, some challenges regarding any sort of access? Um, yeah, this is Kelly Blasco. There is, uh, many of the service have a transition um, assistance program that um, prior to leaving can um, provide a lot of information about uh, moving into the civilian community and the types of services that they can look for as well as, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the process for doing that. So I would encourage uh, 
uh, families to really get hooked into that um, that program. Uh, it's definitely across all the different services, um, and um, that really gives a, a good kind of layout. Now, that's not to say that they're going to have questions and whatnot, but um, I think that uh, is a good starting point. And this is Erica Slating with Military One Source. Um, so certainly, families can call Military One Source, express exactly you know what uh, what you're looking for, what your needs are, and Military One Source will do the research uh, for you. Um, in addition to obviously going through the the TAP program and the, the resources that uh, Dr. Blasco mentioned. I also uh, would like to share that there is a, a spe specific program that we created specifically for military spouses called uh, My Step, or it, it is a, a transition uh, program for military spouses. That uh, you know, we're, for military spouses, there's always a transition, whether you're transitioning into the military um, and then going through the military life and navigating the military systems, and then certainly once you are beyond the, beyond the military, uh, understanding what resources are local in the community. So uh, feel free to give Military One Source a call, express uh, what you're looking for, and we'll do the research. And I would just like to add that the Department of Veterans Affairs has done a lot of work in creating a new welcome kit which has some quick start guides on how to get it started with the VA. It also has done a comprehensive job at looking at what the veteran journey map is, kind of coming from active duty into the VA and what that transition looks like. Um, and they've also done some journey mapping around the caregiver journey as well. So the Department of Veterans Affairs has um, really great resources that can uh, walk you through step by step can explain some expectations along the journey, and of course, um, line you up to any resources, forms, or um, you know, necessary steps to get engaged with VA care. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question asking, as a follow-up, will the TAP programs be tied to ETS sponsorship for family members? I'm not familiar what ETS uh, stands for, sorry. We could ask for a little more clarity around that one. So um, if the person to, who submitted that wouldn't mind uh, sending a little more information, we'll do our best to answer it. A uh, reminder that the chat box is still open. So if folks are able to uh, continue to submit questions, and um, we have gotten a few questions asking if the slides will be available after the webinar. And yes, they will be available. Uh, they will be posted on the National Council for Behavioral Health site, and we will make sure that uh, information is circulated to uh, everyone in attendance. Um, clarification around ETS, that it is end of tour or expiration term of service. So uh, I believe that it's, uh, I don't know 100% that it is tied to the TAP program, but uh, the name the tap transition program is is one name of the program and there's the different names or versions of it may uh include that um as well um i know that it's a priority to help with this transition so i would um check with um the command or resources uh at that particular area to make sure that you have all the information Great, thank you. Um, we received a few questions um, that share that there can be challenges for folks who live in rural areas. And I know some of our presenters touched on that in their slides. Um, would anyone like to elaborate a little more around the unique challenges and then what some of the solutions could be for folks who, um, who may live in areas that are, that are further away from, um, from urban centers? So from the military and veteran caregiver network, we really uh, had the remote caregiver in mind from the very design. And that is why a lot of our peer support group and a lot of our resources are available online. So those with internet access can um, join 
from wherever they're located. We've also found that this is very helpful for caregivers who might be in the hospital, who are homebound um, due to their care recipients' needs, or may not have respite or childcare. So we really have put a lot of focus on virtual opportunities for our rural caregivers. And I know from the VA perspective, a shift to telehealth um, work with the VA Atlas program, which is bringing uh, clinics to um, very remote locations and putting them in places like Walmarts or uh, VFW uh, posts that are you know, in real remote areas to try to make sure that access um, and, and, and physically being able to talk to a provider, a peer um, is made available to those in rural communities. And for military one source, um, certainly we know that rural uh, areas can be a challenge, particularly if you're looking for a non-medical counseling provider to provide face-to-face -face services. Um, but uh, certainly we have, uh, through the military one source network, um, have identified areas where there uh, is a demand for counseling services and have um, uh, and have uh, not only looked at the network, but and tried to recruit providers, non-medical counseling providers in those areas, in areas where um, there are, are maybe no providers or limited providers, we're able to do what's called single case agreement to then um, get that provider um, on the fast track, um, go through the recommended, or not the recommended, but the required training and credentialing to become a military one source non-medical counseling so that non-medical counseling so that a uh, service member or family member can receive those services. Um, outside of non-medical counseling, all of the other services that we provide are by telephone and online and video in many cases. So they really are designed to reach that geographically dispersed population. And I also would like to add that um, you will see more and more um, telehealth or virtual um, visits uh, being integrated into care for this just this kind of um, situation. And I would like to add, it doesn't even necessarily have to be as remote as like hours away. Um, even families that are 30 minutes away from maybe a treatment facility still need to have ready access to um, providers. Um, and you know, ranging transportation and childcare can often be difficult. So we're looking at different ways and planning um, to try to look across the um, TRICARE coverage areas to make sure that um, we, we have the most uh, convenient and accessible access to care as possible. Great, thank you. Um, we've, received, we've received some folks sharing that, um, as, as some presenters alluded to earlier, that overall there can still be some stigma regarding mental health issues just across the board, um, culturally speaking. And I'm wondering if, um, if, if folks could speak a little uh, more to um, how people can feel com most comfortable sharing and then um, being able to be connected to those resources, just knowing that that stigma um, sometimes still persists. We have had overwhelming um, breakthroughs in stigma in the military and veteran caregiver network. Um, I can say this anecdotally from running hundreds of peer support groups where you know, someone will even point out, oh, we can just talk about PTSD here. Absolutely, we can talk about almost anything um, related to the caregiving journey in a safe and comfortable way. I think the peer component of reducing stigma really helps by sharing the lived experience um, and, and showing some of the positive out, outcomes from treatment. Um, I think engaging early and often and having um, a positive model to encourage you to engage in care. We've talked a lot about PTSD. Um, you know, certain programs back in the Marine Corps days would include the family. So uh, mental health is included in the whole plan, um, which I think helped break down the stigma of it amongst family members even. Um, but the peer component, being able to share openly, creating that comfortable space where everyone kind of looks around. And when you're sharing some of the tough stuff that might be coming up in these diagnoses, you are met with head nods and people who really understand. 
it helps you feel less alone. So you're able to know that this isn't just happening to you, that it's happened to many others and that there is support out there and that treatment works and, and getting support for your loved one or even just getting support for yourself can help with your health outcomes in the long run. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Blasco if she would be willing to share a few more words around um, her work with Military Kids Connect and uh, her work with the Sesame Street program. Yeah, thank you. I know in our discussion we've been mostly talking about services through parents but uh, and um, family members, but I, I'm aware of there's two programs, Military Kids Connect, which is uh, online program, core of it is a website, but also social media and outreach. And it's really youth facing from ages, uh, mostly around uh, nine to 17 years old. And the idea is to connect military kids to each other so that they can be role models and peer support for each other. Um, we know they have challenges even around, you know, moving and, uh, uh, transition even out into the civilian world. And the purpose of the um, web program and the types of materials is to holistically look at their health and give them help, teach them healthy habits um, and um, ways to maybe even reach out to a trusted adult if they have uh, more concerning questions. So that's one program for the older children. Um, also, the military, the DHA supports the uh, development of the Sesame Street for Military Family Program, which has been in existence, but it's uh, since 2006. And really what that program is focused on is actually delivering, um, you know, common videos through the Muppets as a trusted source. And it's a kind of a co-viewing experience where a parent and child can watch um, Elmo and his parent talking about separating. And so then it helps with difficult conversations and improves uh, confidence for parents as well as um, uh, overall well-being for parents and uh, their children. Um, most recently, Sesame Street launched a, a, a series of caregiving materials. Um, they're currently um, available on the Sesame Street and Communities um, uh, website at this point, um, uh, and they worked closely with um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation as well as subject matter experts across um, the VA and the DOD and outside um, in the civilian community. Um, great resources um, address a lot of the concerns um, and, and in particular and how they can talk to their children uh, about these unique situations. So um, check those out as um, things that you can actually refer to uh, kids and parents. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blasco. And uh, just in closing, I want to thank everyone who came on and participated and uh, asked all these questions. Very illuminating discussion, and I feel like we got, we got a lot of questions answered, so, so I'm happy for that. Um, just in following, as you, as you leave this webinar, there will be a prompt to uh, fill out an evaluation. Um, if you could please take a minute to do so, it's brief, and that helps us improve our session for the next time. Um, we do really appreciate what you all have to say. Um, again, thank you to our presenters, Dr. Blasco, Ms. Slayton, and Ms. Como, as well as our uh, moderator, Cicely, as well as the folks from the National Council. Um, I want to thank you all so much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all in the next, uh, next one of these meetings and uh, keeping up with us on our listserv. Thank you all. Thank you, Philip, and thanks to everyone for attending today. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll be redirected, as Philip mentioned, to a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you could take a few moments to provide feedback. And on behalf of National Council, Policy Research Associates, and SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center, we'd all like to thank you for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.